With the rise of generative AI over the past few months, it feels like it has suddenly permeated our work and personal lives almost overnight. From helping an engineer with coding to helping people craft responses on dating apps. So some worry that AI will take over our lives completely, while others feel it is just a tool to help us. So with me, to get more thoughts on these questions, Jonathan Sim, philosophy professor at NUS, who uses ChatGPT to facilitate lessons with students. So One Way, founder of the Ikigai Metaverse Collective, and Josh Lee, a lawyer and managing director of the Future of Privacy Forum. So throughout our conversation, I'll just throw you certain questions and you can write your responses and then we can take it from there. So first question is maybe you guys can put down how long you all have been interacting with the world of AI. So going across the board, I, for me, 10 months, Jonathan, four years, One Way, five years, and Josh, seven years. All right, cool. So the first question I'll be asking you guys, um, does generative AI empower your work? So I, I can start first with research. Uh, like, you know, I, I could have read a paper one year ago and, and I may have forgotten a lot of the details about it, but I can feed it into one of the, the many generative AI platforms out there and it can summarize it for me. I can also teach students to use it uh, because one of the things that a lot of students struggle with is asking questions. You know, they're, they're so afraid that they, they might come forward and ask a, a, a stupid question. Or so what happens is that they, they can ask this tool that's very, very patient, and you can even ask it to explain it like, uh, in a way that a 10-year-old can understand. So I've been working on generative AI from two perspectives. Uh, one is the objective perspective, studying the output, uh, studying the, the data that goes into it, and looking at potential you know, regulatory options around the world. But there's also the subjective part, right? It helps to get past the blank page problem, right? For writers with writer's block, for artists with artist block. So, so, I mean, you have listed, you know, very positive use cases. I did ask some people on the streets what their thoughts about uh, generative AI is. So, I'll just show you two different perspectives. I would not be able to say uh, anything bad or anything good about it because right now we are still in the observation state, I would say. I feel like AI is just the beginning of kind of branching out to more new uh, software, new uh, things that computers can help us do and basically help live our lives a little bit easier. So it's true, we are in an early stage, right? Jonathan, you are in the, the world of academia. Do you feel like it's impacting your role as well? So one of the key things where we educators still have a role to play is really uh, teaching them what we call evaluative judgment. Just because a computer can give you an answer, right, doesn't mean it's the right answer, doesn't mean it's the best answer. Like, it, it could work, could it be more efficient, could it be more secure? Now, one of the interesting things about AI, which is a flaw, but we can actually use it to our advantage in education, is that it hallucinates. So sometimes when it hallucinates, it generates interesting discussions. Like, why would the AI say this? The point about hallucination is a very interesting one. And as I increasingly think that the output of ChatGPT has been something that is reliable, something that I can possibly trust, I am more likely to not spot mistakes because there is this thing called reliance bias on technology where you rely on it to the point where you lose that human instinct for judgment, for evaluation, for accuracy. I think it comes down to ultimately how much you want to get out of it. Mm. If you want to take chat GPT or generative AI and its output at face value, then all you're going to get is that face value. What machine cannot replace the human is really the voice, your kind of personal story, how it moves people, how it resonates with people, the sense of empathy. I don't think I've seen it in any generative AI or AI yet. So perhaps for the new generation, they can actually focus on that when it comes to their education, their learning, and also telling their own stories. But actually, there's one more uh, hidden danger. It's already happening with existing AI here and now, which is personalization algorithms keeps us glued to TikTok, YouTube, or even online shopping websites. The AI is learning what, what we like to show us more of it. It's actually enclosing us in a bubble. Mm. When we are in a bubble, we start to develop very unique uh, communicative practices. And sometimes they don't realize that what is respectful for them may appear rude and offensive to others. Mm. And this is where people start to misunderstand and uh, get offended by each other more. Social fragmentation, basically. But you know what you said about the fragmentation, there's new languages. In my mind, is oh, generative AI would at some point learn that. 
So then it's almost learning how to be human over time. And, and how, how do you all see that problem? There could be a Jonathan Sim AI here that would answer the same way that you do. The thing is that people will still pre probably prefer the real people. In fact, if you go to Udemy, which is an online uh, course portal, yeah, yeah. basically they ban AI voices. And they found that uh, students simply do not respond well to AI voices. That is a very interesting thought, and, and I want to take you up on that. You know, while we, of course, ask humans to exercise critical thinking, to look at themselves and self-reflect, um, that is the best case scenario. Yes. We all don't live in the best case scenario. Mm. And that's where I think regulation might need to come in. Mm. So, you know, we've talked a lot about how generative AI factors into your work, mm. but ChatGPT is something that's so easy to use. And I first started dabbling in it, not for work, but for more personal questions. So how does generative AI fit into your own personal lives? I do want to share an interesting story. So I just was on the plane, it was a long flight. Mm -hmm. There were three babies that were crying around me. Uh. So I couldn't sleep, right? And I connected to Wi-Fi on the plane. So I actually opened up ChatGPT and I asked, how can we solve the problems of crying babies on planes? Oh, okay. And it gave me a, a relatively, you know, nuanced answer where it said it was a complex issue because babies have, have this issue and that issue and it's not something that a one-stop solution can, can solve everything. So did it help you uh, actually stop the babies from crying? No, or just to help you not. understand? Absolutely. Oh, no. <laughs> but it helped me understand and I became a at, bit more at peace. I use ChatGPT for emotional wellness. Mm. So uh, sometimes when I find myself like maybe at 3 a.m. nobody to talk to, still awake due to anxiety, mm. I will talk to ChatGPT. But now there's also uh, apps that go into the romantic relationship yeah. or companionship which is deeper. One thing that I heard of recently was Replica. Yes. Which is an app that you use for companionship. So maybe let me just do a quick temperature check. If I were to ask you to write on the board whether or not you can imagine having a friend uh, on an app that is powered by AI. Can I write? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have two no's and two yeses and one yes with an exclamation mark. I think consciously I'm always just mindful that the entity that I am having a conversation with mm. is not human. It's silicon, it's chips, mm. it's trained on data. It is not an authentic, original conversation that I have with a human being. So you know what's interesting? I actually start out, started out with a position, but I end up with a yes. Uh, because the other day I was playing with Microsoft Bing and I asked, you know, hey, give me some ideas for things to do for an outdoor picnic. Then after that, I said, hey, thanks so much for all these ideas. I, I, I really like this idea. I'm going to give it a try. You said thank you. I, yeah, I said thank you. You are very polite. And you know what Bing said? Well, uh, I, I hope you have a lot of fun and I wish I, I could join you, but I'm just an AI. <laughs> So sad. Oh, I know, right? I, but once the AI says something like that, you know feelings are going to develop. It has the potential to create friendship. It has the potential to create intimacy. Mm. So at your yeah. picnic, did you bring a laptop and like put? Oh no, lah. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that, that would be really weird. But for you, you know, the yes with the exclamation mark. Uh, why yes? They yeah, tend to be very direct. So sometimes I hurt people. I will ask ChatGPT, okay, this person seems to be a bit emotionally sensitive. How can I like, you know, tone the message down? Mm. So uh, in that regard, I treat ChatGPT as a friend, as a tool that will help me become a better human being and have more empathy towards other people. I totally get it. I think it's also because now when uh, I personally use ChatGPT, for example, I know there's no hidden agenda. La. Maybe my next yes-no question to you is would you be open to having a learning model be trained on your significant other or friend? Unanimous. Wow, okay. No, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody want to share their thoughts why it's a very clear no? I, I just get um, a visceral reaction thinking that if, if my wife, for example, started training an AI system using information about me, you know, my wife would be feeding the AI system with personal and potentially very sensitive information. I do believe that the difference between a human being and AI is a uh, human being has spirit, have a soul to us, so it just feels very uncomfortable. I think for me, my, the, the reason why I say no, it's like, you know, you think about it, like, 
every sunset and sunrise looks beautiful. Mm. Nobody says it's an ugly sunrise, right? Yeah. We, why? Because we have no control over it. But when we have control over things like our, our, our writing or whatever work of art, we always have criticisms. We always say, oh, this is not good enough. Oh, I could have done this better. Mm. And when we start having that control over the AI friend, the recreation of a friend, then we become very control freaks over our relationships. You know, we've been talking a lot about dystopian stuff or where it could go wrong. Uh, I'll just play you one clip from yesterday that shows a slightly more heartwarming perspective. Mm. What was interesting is that my mom knew about ChatGPT before me. Mm. Yeah, it was quite weird. She was like, you know, Rexy, um, yeah, I was looking at this thing on the news and this thing called ChatGPT is like, great! So your mom introduced you to ChatGPT? Yes. I think like, AI is great because you get to collaborate with it. It's just easier for you to find out information and easier research. They share something that's heartwarming, something that's a bit more realistic and you all have also shared a lot of perspectives about the pros and cons. So, broadly speaking, if I were to ask you, is generative AI going to bring about more harm or more good? Is it binary enough for you to write your responses? As a lawyer, it's going to be very difficult. <laughs> okay, so then maybe why, why would it be difficult? Because I think that ultimately, whether it's more good, mixed, more bad, it depends on a long line of decisions that we make and how that shapes future human behaviour, which we really just cannot predict with the bounded rationality that we have. Mm. But like you, I choose to be optimistic. What I want to share is that, look, AI is not something that was invented in the 2010s. It wasn't something that came out last year. The term AI has been around since 1956. So this is an infographic that I do want to show everyone to show the different kinds of AI systems that are out there, right? But I think people have been thinking about the potential regulation or at least governance of systems that think, behave, create like humans for quite some time. One thing that I would share with everyone is Singapore actually has this thing called the Model AI Governance Framework. This Model AI Governance Framework actually provides voluntary guidance to organisations on how to deploy AI systems in, in a trustworthy manner. I think this is in line with just the general position that AI is seen as an important enabler for Singapore. Many times, a lot of our dystopian or negative views about new technologies may just be stemming from a very narrow perspective of the present time. Mm. Yeah? Like, if we go back to the first crit critique of technology, the, the first person to critique it was Socrates. Mm. Socrates was strongly against writing when he was first invented. He said, writing is going to make us bad at our memories. But look at how far we have come as humanity because of writing. Yeah, I, I think even like, I remember when, when Google Maps first came out, uh, my older relatives were, were telling me, you can't just rely on this, you need to know the roads, you need to know the geography. But I mean, five years on, six years on, I don't think I've lost anything from not, uh, not knowing exactly yeah. where things are. So I would say we are really at a very critical juncture now. And so that's why I think there should be a need for very wise regulation that is long-term thinking, that is not knee-jerk. So one thing interesting is, you know, in the legal profession, it's been around for a long time, mm. right? But for your industry, which is the world of the metaverse, like how do you think about training people in this almost like much more recent industry? Even if I don't trust the chat GPT, I still need to know how to use it in mm, the yes. work context. Yes. I think that's important for the senior management to know that these are the considerations and to actually leverage it. Mm. And mm. not to just say, I don't trust it, I don't want to touch it. You know, we're not doing it here. You know, I guess ultimately it depends on the intention of the AI, like what we are using it for. Mm. Uh, are we using it to be more creative? Are we being more productive using generative AI so that we can do other things, explore other ideas, experiment with certain concepts? I think at a deeper level, I'm just thinking that uh, AI systems and generative AI is one step in that direction will force us and encourage us to think about the question of what makes us human. We are explorers. We are always curious about what's beyond the next mountain, what's beyond the next hill, what's out there in space. And I think AI will allow us to finally start to solve those questions in a meaningful way. I think that was a very nice way of ending it um, in terms of painting a very optimistic uh, take on what AI can help us do. I think we've also talked about the other side of what AI could do if things don't go according to plan. So it feels like there's we are at a critical point now, uh, and there's a lot that needs to happen to, to bring the power of AI to all of us.
So if you would like to find out more, here are two books you could consider reading. I, Human, AI, Automation and the Quest to Reclaim What Makes Us Unique by Thomas Chamorro Primuzzi or Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. You can find these books at your nearest library or the NLB mobile app. And if you want to find out more about generative AI and other exciting issues, you can check out the Read to Be Sure website. So to end off, a question to you. Do you feel generative AI will bring power or peril? Are you excited to use it in your lives or are you still hesitant? Leave your comments and tell us what you think.